Hello everyone and welcome to the latest edition of Inside Innovation Live, our series of shows that explore the exciting innovations happening across financial services. I'm Rachel Levy, Global Head of Innovation Engineering at SWIFT, and today we're diving into the world of generative AI and how to unlock its potential in finance. To do this, I'm delighted to be joined by Rupert Nicolay, Solution Strategy Lead in Microsoft's Worldwide Financial Services Consulting Team. Welcome, Rupert. Could you kick us off by telling us a little bit about your background and your work? Sure. Thanks, Rachel. Great to be with you here today. Um, I've worked in, in tech and financial services you know, for most of my career, in particular in data and analytics. Uh, and right now, I'm a director in a small team we've got here at Microsoft that works with tier one banks around the globe who are pursuing more advanced uh, scenarios with our technology or deploying some kind of new business model that pivots around Microsoft technology. So we have good insights into what a representative sample of tier one banks around the world are really doing. Brilliant. Thanks, Rupert. It's great to have you today. And it's great to see so many of you across the world tuning in as well. For those joining us, please feel free to ask questions in the LinkedIn live stream throughout the session. We will try to answer as many of them as possible towards the end of the session. So let's dive in, Rupert. AI is, of course, becoming quite a hot topic in many conversations. Um, but I do think it's important that we are all clear on what we actually mean when we talk about artificial intelligence. So maybe you can start by giving us a bit of a primer as to what AI actually is. Yes, I think, you know, in the uh, context of broader AI, we can think about systems that really can be trained to work with data and classify it, predict an outcome or solve a problem or answer a question. So really in financial services today, the customers we've been working with have been training AI models to look at things like uh, risk insights, credit decisions, predicting cash flow, uh, and quite importantly, detecting anomalies and finding fraud. Uh, so these are all traditional uses for AI, and they're very much pivot around prediction with the data that the enterprise has today. And in the next 30 minutes, as the title of the webinar gives away, we'll mostly focus on generative AI. So could you maybe share with the audience how generative AI differs from other types of AI, such as machine learning or deep learning? Sure, yeah. So really, rather than classifying or predicting using historical data, Gen AI is in fact creating new text or images or code, or in fact data, um, with uh, new results that are informed by a large corpus of data which has been used to train that data. So the key word there is really informed, so they don't necessarily repeat what's been there, uh, but they're informed by what's been there. Um, and they do a particularly good job when patterns recur in the data that they're able to look at in that broad set of data. So one key consideration if you're working in a financial institution today is that in most applications of generative AI, the Gen AI models are pre-trained on this large corpus of data and we're using them as is to solve problems, as opposed to training models with enterprise data to do a particular job of predicting some kind of outcome. Um, and so this has uses and uh, you know some drawbacks as well that we'll talk about later. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that when I mentioned what can be generated, uh, it is uh, possible to, to generate uh, not just text and, and images and so forth, but of course code as well. And so we know that in the last 12 months, there's been a, an explosion in interest around generative AI, which I think has largely been driven by the launch of ChatGPT, BARD, and other AI-driven natural language tools. But of course, this technological advancement didn't just start 12 months ago. So can you provide us a, a bit of history as to how this technology has actually developed in recent years to be as powerful as it is today? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the last sort of five to six years has really been uh, transformative. Um, and the, the pivot that happened at that stage around sort of 2017, 2018 was the development of what were called transformer based approaches to processing sentences and language. Uh, and really kind of the, without going into great technical detail, the kind of change and shift here was to process uh, sentences as a whole, as opposed to considering individual words the whole time, 
which had been the approach to interpreting language largely up until then. And so we've got this approach called self-attention and the words are looked at together and that enables the model to gain the context in which a particular word has been used and to understand the meaning of that word in context, uh, which could, of course, vary considerably. As we know, in the English language, you know, many words have, uh, have multiple meanings. And then that's been coupled in the last few years with the emergence of specialized uh, chips and silicon, uh, which have been deployed to train the models with large amounts of data. And so that's aligned somewhat with the emergence of cloud computing um, to provide that capacity. And the net result has been, you know, the technology combined with the capacity and the full scope of the internet to train these models. Um, that's the, the kind of potted history of the last five or six years um, that have led to, uh, to generative AI and where it is today. Amazing. And so today we know that generative AI is being applied across industries and societies. Uh, we will, of course, focus this session on financial services, but could you maybe also give us a glimpse as to how generative AI is already being applied to transform businesses in other industries as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's perhaps interesting to look at another regulated industry like healthcare, um, and there generative AI is being used to extract key information and provide notes and suggestions uh, in the clinical documentation that results from a, uh, a patient and clinician discussion. Uh, and all of this boosts the time the clinician has to spend with the actual patient and can also enhance the accuracy of the data that's collected from that discussion and potentially even spot, you know, uh, things that the clinician might have missed in that uh, interaction. Uh, and all of that data could then go into some kind of electronic health record as well. Uh, and this is happening on quite a widespread basis today. And there's a company called Nuance, which is owned by Microsoft, which is very active in this space um, and, uh, and provides some of these technologies. Well, I mean, it's, it's truly amazing. Um, and as we start to think about financial services, it's becoming increasingly clear the breadth and depth of possibilities that AI can offer to businesses and their customers, um, with there being so many different opportunities for innovation. Given your role and your engagement with many clients, which you mentioned, Tier 1 across financial services, how, how do you see these institutions actually thinking about generative AI? So, uh, first of all, there's a great deal of excitement uh, and, you know, uh, almost too many opportunities to go after. Uh, so that's exciting. Um, and uh, many um, of the tier one banks we work with have narrowed things down by starting with applications that assist staff rather than work with customers directly. Uh, and it's you know, clear that that carries slightly less risk and provides a greater uh, modicum of control over the uh, generative AI type, uh, type of capabilities that they, they use. Also, as they've matured over the last year, uh, a lot of financial institutions are starting to think more clearly about what, what they'll pursue themselves uh, by building out something versus what they're actually gonna receive as part of the technologies they may already subscribe to today. But of course, you know, many solution vendors today are starting to weave these capabilities into the technologies um, that, that they have. Um, and so uh, either way, our customers have been largely surprised by how fast they've been able to achieve some of the uh, productivity boosts that they have with the technology as it stands. And some of that goes to the pre-trained nature of these models that I mentioned. Great. So it sounds like it's really a case of thinking both about the what and the how um, as institutions think about generative AI. Um, so I guess more specifically, what are some of the key business areas that you're seeing generative AI being applied to? And maybe what are some of the key use cases within those business areas as well? Yeah, so I think, you know, if I were to pick three that really stand out uh, in terms of areas, um, you know, the first would really be around personal productivity. Um, so uh, and very much in the information worker space. So improving the productivity of information workers as they uh, meet, document, write and author content and so forth. The second would be in sales and customer service. Uh, and within our banking customers, the sweet spot there, um, certainly there's, there's a lot that can be done to boost the productivity of, of sales interactions. But on the customer service side, the sweet spot appears to be in the area of moderately complex products. So not super simple kind of service interactions, 
my card isn't working. What's the problem? Well, you know, it's expired. It's this, it's that. Uh, but, you know, my mortgage is awaiting approval. What are the steps that are outstanding for that to complete? You know, those types of questions are, are a great uh, kind of fit. And then the third would be in the area of software development, which is, in fact, quite mature. Uh, and, you know, many of our banking customers today are almost tech firms, if you look at the proportion of staff that actually work in software development. Um, so that's uh, that's a key area and any productivity boosts we can actually grab there are, are, are certainly welcome. Uh, and keep in mind, it's not just a productivity boost, but it's also a quality boost that's potentially available uh, to folks in software development. Thanks, Rupert. So I, I think it's clear that AI is not just a trend. It's really quite the transformative force that will reshape our, our business landscape. But of course, there's one area that's top of mind for financial institutions, and that's governance. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on how organizations should and can go about ensuring strong governance, specifically in key areas like enabling ethical and the responsible use of AI. Yeah, so I think uh, you know um, many of our uh, of our larger tier one customers are not coming at this completely cold. Um, so you know they've had for decades, for example, uh, governance over the types of models that they use for things like credit decisioning and similar. Mm -hmm. So they're building on some of the learnings from those more, uh, albeit simpler, kind of scenarios to address, uh, and they're taking it a level up from there. So many have really created uh, some sort of assessment board and a template for evaluating use cases. Uh, and in fact, we as Microsoft have uh, taken the learnings from our own internal deployments and from what we've heard customers talking about. And we actually you know, offer such a template, which you can quite easily discover. You just search for responsible AI template, I think you'll pick it up, um, which talks about uh, you know, evaluating a use case, talking about the oversight that's required, intelligibility of the model that supports it, the potential benefits and harms and so forth, risks of stereotyping, uh, potential for misuse and so forth. Um, so these are all the, the key considerations that, um, that, are, that are coming into play. Uh, once again, I'd be, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's important to be aware of the fact that many of these are landing um, with staff use first before direct to customer type application. Yeah. That, that makes sense. And one question that I get asked all of the time is around how generative AI and even AI more broadly is regulated today around the world and how this might change. Any insight you can share with us there? Yeah, I mean, uh, once again, this is also an uh, you know, interesting and, and kind of hotly uh, <laughs> debated topic. Uh, and you'll see, I think the UK has just hosted a forum on AI regulation and so forth. Uh, we've been quite interested to watch the uh, the EU's uh, proposed AI Act, uh, which includes a series of um, components which were added, in fact, after the initial uh, draft was, was, was proposed, which relate to Gen AI. Um, and so some of the specific Gen AI requirements that they've called out there include prohibiting, you know, creating manipulative content, uh, their quality assessment requirements, there are registration requirements for foundational models across the, uh, the EU. So this is, of course, proposed regulation. Um, so when implemented, not all of those look that easy to comply with necessarily. Um, of course, it'll depend on the use case. So there's much still to be determined uh, in this space. A further key consideration is really around the copyright of generative AI, because by its nature, it's creating content. Uh, and so that's a, a key consideration. Uh, we made some commitments around uh, copyright uh, of, uh, of uh, information that comes out of our co-pilots uh, as Microsoft for enterprise customers. Um, so there is, you know, interesting um, uh, debate on that uh, available um, that, that, uh, that one could take a look at. Thanks, Rupert. It definitely seems as if, um, you know, regulation is becoming more and more of a focus and we're seeing uh, across regions, um, you know, new uh, sort of commentary and, and discussion around the regulation, which is, is great to see. Now, I'd like to take a bit of a deep dive into one of Microsoft's newest generative AI offerings, M365 Copilot, um, for which you're currently running an early access program. Could you tell us more about what M365 Copilot is and how it can benefit an organization? 
Yeah. So the M365 Copilot is really a personal assistant, which surfaces within all of the popular Microsoft 365 technologies that you a business uh, folks would be accustomed to using today. So that means within Outlook, Word, PowerPoint, Teams, and so forth. Um, and so to take a few examples of how it might help you, you could think about, for example, uh, working in Outlook uh, and being sent a mail, which includes a long trail of interactions, which someone's decided it's appropriate for you to consider and has been forwarded to you. So the first thing you do is ask for a summarization of that, which uh, Gen AI would, apply, uh, would provide, and you'd see it surfaced in the Microsoft 365 Copilot. You then might ask it to propose a response, and that response is crafted in the context of the information that's being shared uh, in the preceding emails and based on a general direction that you prompted with. So for example, yes, confirm this is all good uh, and uh, do it in a formal kind of way. Um, so, uh, so, so, so that's possible. Uh, you'll see it surface in Teams uh, and make it possible to review a summary of the entire meeting. You'll be able to ask it questions about uh, who made what points, what were the key decisions that came out, what were the key concerns, who had them, uh, and so forth. And certainly, uh, personally, I found that terrifically useful. Customers have told me that's very useful. I could also ask it to draft a PowerPoint presentation or start a Word document for me based on other content that I pointed at. Um, so those are all useful things. It can also operate in the mode of a coach in which you can say, well, I'm going to go at it, but I would like some assistance. You know, can you recommend changes to make the style here more uh, you know, friendly or positive or whatever the case may be? Um, so uh, quite exciting and certainly we've had you know, strong positive feedback, feedback on those organizations who've joined the EAP program. So, so you mentioned the EAP program, which you're running for a number of customers, including Swift. Can you tell us more about what this program is and why it was put in place? Yeah, so early access programs, we have them for a number of technologies. And um, as you mentioned, Swift has been part of uh, the one for the uh, M365 co-pilot for some months now typically a manageable number of customers. So this may be by invitation that we go to uh, with a technology. There may be some uh, considerations around how it operates. Um, limitations uh, may also be disclosed. Um, those haven't been that extensive with the M365 program, but essentially uh, the uh, early adopters then get to use the technology prior to general, general availability. Uh, and so that's been the case uh, with ourselves and Swift. Um, there are actually a, a number of early adopter programs running at any point in time. So for other technologies and co-pilots, uh, there can be, in fact, are uh, early adopter programs running today. And so this early adopters program has been running for some months now. Do you have any uh, initial findings that you can share uh, with our listeners today on how the tool is or isn't benefiting organizations in terms of tangible value? Yeah, so we've actually just last week, um, we put out some some early metrics from uh, surveying a few hundred of those uh, of those folks who've been using the um, M365 Copilot. And, and the, uh, the, the kind of timing for this is aligned with the fact that we've made the M365 Copilot generally available for enterprise customers uh, as of the 1st of November. And so some of the key metrics that come out of this are that, uh, you know, around 70% of the co-pilot users have said they were more productive. Uh, a similar proportion have said that it improved the quality of their work. Um, and they felt that they were around 29, 30% faster in, in tasks like searching, writing, and summarizing. Um, and that they spent maybe two thirds, uh, two thirds of users spent less time uh, processing email 85% uh, felt uh, it got them to a good first draft faster. And so we also put out kind of interesting questions around, uh, would you, uh, what do you want more, co-pilot or a free lunch? That's uh, my favorite <laughs> question, Rupert. <laughs> uh, and so, well, uh, you can go and check out the blog post as of last week on some detailed metrics around who said what in response to that question. Uh, but certainly the appetite seemed to be there for, uh, for co-pilot. Uh, perhaps more than, than for lunch, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, Rupert. 
So conscious of time, and I want to leave a few minutes at the end for audience questions. There's one last thing uh, that I, I'm sure our audience wants to hear from you, and, and that's some practical advice uh, as they look to introduce generative AI into their organization. Um, so firstly, what do you see as the first step uh, on the journey for an organization who, who's looking to understand and use generative AI? Yeah, so I mean, I think we see customers having success uh, if they think about this uh, almost you could think of kind of two teams uh, or, or uh, splitting the approach in your organization. So you really need a team that's familiar with the uh, detail uh, of the technology and is also or has complementary team members that are able to support with things like the responsible AI assessments and so mm -hmm. forth. And can perhaps also think about uh, universal reusable strategies which will apply across the organization. For example, what's appropriate in terms of our organization uh, in, uh, in communications with customers? And can we create a universal filter that will apply that type of filter across the organization? And then I think because, as I mentioned earlier, the use cases are so extensive, you want to complement this with distributed business unit specific teams that are looking at what, are, what, what can we specifically go uh, after in those areas and they then work with the more central team. So that seems to be a, a good way to, th to think about going after it. And then within that, to think about, you know, uh, would the first use cases we, we target be those who uh, are, are, or those that are best uh, uh, handled by staff first, and then think forward towards, you know, uh, cases that could be used with, uh, with customers. And as they start this journey, we, we've talked about the fact that there's a, a large number of ideas and applicabilities of generative AI. Um, so how should we as institutions be thinking about prioritizing these use cases? Yes, yeah, so I think um, the internal productivity uh, scenarios with uh, an easy, provable, fast time to value are the ones that are the obvious uh, ones to prioritize. Within that, a sanity check on the build versus buy. Don't build it out and invest weeks and weeks if you're going to get it soon, <laughs> uh, or it's going to be baked into something like the M365 uh, co-pilot and so forth. But then at the same time, I think one wants to have a, uh, an eye on the bigger picture and the bigger view of how this could transform one's business. So to give a simple example, you know, many of our customers are interested in how they can scale the type of advice or quality advice they give to customers in areas like wealth management, uh, investments, insurance, uh, lending, and so forth. Uh, and in fact, many customers are left out of getting high quality advice there because they don't go past the bar of you know, net minimum assets under management, or whatever the, the, the bar might be within, within an organization. So getting that out there um, with these types of tools is very interesting and, and appealing. Uh, in the first stage, could we just turbocharge the, the way the advice is given? Certainly possible. In the second phase, might we be thinking about new products and the product design in the context of how it could be taken to market and serviced with this type of technology? So one wants to have a, pick, a view on that kind of final North Star for one's business and the types of areas one plays in. Thanks, that makes sense. So throughout this session, we've received uh, some great questions from the audience, and there's a few in particular I wanted to ask you. Um, the first question relates back to what you mentioned earlier, as institutions need to think about how they're actually going to deploy and explore generative AI use cases. So the question is, can you help by sharing um, how do uh, we know when to leverage enterprise-specific generative AI versus custom AI um, for a specific use case? Yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, just to give you an idea, very roughly, I would say uh, very few of the applications that we're talking about with customers today require uh, the enterprise to go after building an entirely new generative AI model. Those are really in the minority versus those who are consuming an existing uh, uh, built model. Uh, and they are uh, really niche scenarios that have tremendous value. So. Um, the budget required to kind of train a foundational model is quite significant. That's, uh, you know, an initial hurdle to overcome. Uh, and then, you know, a strong understanding of what's possible in terms of integrate, integrating existing pre-built models into enterprise data, which is increasingly possible, 
uh, is uh, is certainly well worth having to better understand. You know, do you need to go at it yourself and build the whole model versus are you going to consume an existing model, which is far more likely. Um, and another question here from Jigal Joshi. How useful if a tool is generative AI in thinking about sustainable technology? Yeah, so um, I think great question. Uh, and we're certainly seeing some early applications uh, in that space um, amongst our customers and partners. Uh, so one example would be in uh, you know, reviewing uh, sustainability plans and so forth uh, from, uh, from customers uh, as they uh, you know, with, who might be you know, lending customers for the business, uh, project finance and so forth. Um, the other area in which there is work taking place is in uh, an extended view of the trade finance value chain uh, and the participants in that. And of course, it's a complex business to go after all those different levels, uh, probably too manual and too effort ridden for most to do it. But can we apply generative AI in that space? And the answer is possibly. Um, to give you a better insight. And so that could be the bank, but obviously banks giving their customers insight into that uh, into that trade finance value chain. Great. So before we go, I do have one last question, as I'd like to get your big picture thoughts on the future. So imagining that you had a crystal ball, Rupert, uh, how do you predict that generative AI will change the financial landscape in the next 10 years? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's uh, wonderful to dream about what would be possible. As I mentioned earlier, you know, what I would hope to see in the next five years or so would be the potential to reach a far broader audience with a higher quality or better value product is, uh, is certainly um, something that I would see as being on the horizon. Greater degrees of product personalization are also almost certainly uh, possible. Um, and uh, the... Um, uh, the other area that we're seeing a lot of interest and which could be transformed might be the compliance space. So we know we've got ever more people deployed in compliance in our large customers, uh, and there is a lot of manual work that takes place in that space. There appear to be a lot of strong opportunities to automate the compliance function uh, as well. Finally, you know, I expect you know, many of us have if, if you with a strong retail bank today, you may have some form of assistant who analyzes your transactions, maybe gives you some insight into your cash flow and so forth. It's still fairly rudimentary and based on that purely transactional data that you have. You know, are we going to get to the point where I'm getting an interactive level of assistance with my bank to be able to kind of guide me, me give instructions which are then converted to executable, uh, you know, um, uh, mandates and so forth across my portfolio, uh, that seems entirely possible as well in the kind of five to 10 year horizon, I think. So a lot to look forward to. Um, and I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Uh, uh, thank you firstly, Rupert, so much for joining me. Uh, this has not only been a really insightful conversation, but a really inspiring one as well. And I think you've provided us all with some great insights, which we can use to, to really unlock the potential of generative AI within our organizations. Uh, I also want to thank our audience for joining us. Uh, we really hope to see you next time and I uh, hope you enjoyed the session today. Right.